And I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm sincerely sorry that you were taught a false religion. Mainline American Christianity, Protestantism, Evangelicalism, whatever you want to call it, is a false religion. What's up YouTube, Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I am always contending for the faith, once for all, delivered to the saints. And today we start a two-part series on whether or not Jesus is a liar. Stick around. <music> While I was on my break from YouTube, which I'm prone to do, unfortunately, I found a video on Facebook contending that Jesus is a liar and it's provable with one Bible verse. This piqued my interest and so I decided to watch a video. And I gotta say, what bothered me more about the video was not that he was asserting that Jesus is a liar, was not the... Um, hypocrisy of using more than one verse to establish that Jesus is a liar while contending that it can do it can be done in one verse it was why he thinks this way what led to this man having the the thought patterns and the worldview that he now holds and as i was looking into this more finding his official youtube channel to watch the video there so that i could then respond to it i saw response videos and some of them are very well done and some of them are just let's be honest, piss poor Protestant ways of trying to explain, just doing the exact same thing he accuses Protestants of doing. But nobody addressed the issue of why he thinks this way. And that's what I want to do first. So let's hear the argument and then we'll just kind of follow along with him for a couple of spots. We'll skip the middle where he actually makes the argument and we'll deal with that in part two because that requires a lot of hermeneutical work and a lot of exegesis. And so that's going to have to be its own video. But part one, why does he think this way? Well, first of all, what's his argument? Well, his, his YouTube channel is Morg Official. I don't know his actual name. It'd be nice to know his actual name, but he goes by the name of Morg. So let's just take a couple of seconds and hear what he has to say, and then we'll, we'll kind of go through this video and we'll talk about it. And a full disclaimer, I don't think mainland American Christianity is going to come out of this looking very good. So let's listen to Morg. According to mainstream religion, lying is a sin, but I bet you didn't know that the Bible shows that Jesus is a liar. And it wasn't just a little white lie either. It's about as big of a lie as you can possibly imagine because it's about the end of the world in a situation that's actually similar to what we're experiencing right now. I'm going to show you the one verse that shows that Jesus is a liar and what it has to do with the end of the world. There it is. There's the claim, the one verse. Now, I I got to point out, guy, uh, you used more than one verse, and you used one verse against another verse to prove, see, here's a lie. So you're lying. You're not using one verse to do this. That was the promise, and the promise was not kept. But, but he's going to explain why he's doing this, and I love that he took the time to do that. That's really helpful. He's taking the time to explain why he's doing this and why he thinks that way. And I love that. So let's skip ahead. I've got my notes here. We're going to skip ahead to the 45 second mark. Well, we'll go 44. And we'll get to the part of why he thinks this way. So we've skipped his intro and we've skipped his, you know, subscribe and ring the not notification bell shtick. And we're going to get to why he thinks this way. So let's let him go for a little bit longer comes out. Before I can show you how Jesus clearly lied in the verse that shows it, you have to know a little bit about the end of the world, or what mainstream religion calls the end times, or the great tribulation. Exactly. <laughs> and this, this is the crux of the matter. What he's going to explain is not the biblical view not the historic Christian view of the end times. And that's part of the problem. So we're already, he's not wrong. In order to understand what he's going to talk about, you have to understand the end times. He's not wrong. But what he explains to us about the end times is. So let's just let him explain. So according to mainstream Christianity, this will be a cataclysmic event when wars will break out everywhere, the Antichrist will come to power, and demons will roam the earth attacking people. Yeah, 
really. Eventually, Jesus will return, and this is known as the Second Coming, and set up the Kingdom of Heaven on Earth and have the devil chained up for a thousand years. Then he'll be released again. Anyway, before all that happens, before the world is thrown into chaos, everyone who believes in Jesus will disappear. Again, yes, really. They all just literally vanish instantly, and they're transported to heaven. I'm not making this up. This mass disappearance occurs so that believers will be safe before the terrors of the end times happen. And this is known as the rapture. Now, by I'm not laughing at him. I'm laughing with him. His mockery and his scorn that he's painstakingly obvious on his face for what mainline American Christianity thinks about the end of the world, he and I are like this. I, I feel the same way. I think the same way. Mainline American Christianity, mainline American Protestantism has a stupid eschatology. They have an unbiblical view of the end of the world. And as we're going to see, this unbiblical view did some real damage on this guy. So, before we get offended that he's mocking what Christians believe, I gotta say I'm on the same page as this guy right now. I feel the exact same way. I have just as much disgust and disdain and I will in the same way mock what mainline American Protestants believe about the end times because it's not biblical. But now we're gonna get to the heart of the matter and this is where we really need to pay attention to what he says because it's important. By the way, I want to mention, I was born into a strict Christian household, and I was a Christian for many years, and the idea of the rapture was absolutely terrifying. Whenever my parents would leave to go shopping or whatever, I'd run to the TV and turn on the news to make sure that the rapture didn't happen, that I wasn't left behind. I can't emphasize enough how ideas like hell and the rapture are traumatizing for children. These ideas can result in what's known as RTS, or Religious Trauma Syndrome. Dr. Marlene Winnell, PhD, writes, Religious Trauma Syndrome is the condition experienced by people who are struggling with leaving an authoritarian, dogmatic religion and coping with the damage of indoctrination. Religious Trauma Syndrome can be compared to a combination of PTSD and complex PTSD. Now that's something I know all too well, and I experienced this firsthand. Now, I did a video all about that if you want to know more. Did you listen to him? Did you hear him? What did the Protestant view of the end times do to him? It did to him what it does to a lot of people, what it did to me when I was younger, when I was a part of mainline American Christianity, when I fell for the Left Behind books, hook, line, and sinker. And what's most important for us to take away here, he did not in those times of fear turn to the scriptures for comfort and for peace. Remember Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give, not as the world gives do I give. Peace, comfort. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He did not turn, nor did his mainline American Protestant parents send him to the word for the clear promises of peace and perseverance through hardship from Christ himself to us. No, he went to the news. Mainline American Protestants are completely enveloped in the end of the world right now. I have seen any number of but stupid prophetic videos on YouTube and posted on Facebook about people having dreams and people having visions and this is going to happen in the next couple of months. And of course, it never does. And what's more sickening than that is these, these Protestants, these Christians never apologize for lying, never apologize for being false prophets. They just move on to the next one and their thousands and hundreds of thousands of subscribers just move along with them. So he turned to the news, and that's what I did, and that's what a lot of people do. A lot of people think that you have to read the newspaper or read news articles or watch the news in order to understand the end times. We need to read the Bible, and we need to understand what Jesus is doing for us right here, right now, through word and sacrament, bringing the peace which surpasses all understanding, the peace 
of mind, the peace of conscience, that is the forgiveness of sins that is going to see us through the tribulation. Now, as far as his post-traumatic stress disorder, this is a very real thing as well. It, sadly, it is. And he's absolutely right about authoritarian religions. He's absolutely right. Another thing that we need to understand is what he says this effect has on children. Now, I'm a Lutheran, and I'm raising my children to be Lutheran. And so when we talk about our faith and what we believe and what the Bible says and who Jesus is, there's no fear of sin and hell in my children. There is only joy and gratitude that they are forgiven, that Jesus loves them, that Jesus clings to them, that Jesus claimed them, that Jesus took ownership of them in their baptism. So do my children have a problem with Christianity? Are they running around in fear that God's going to get them? No. No, because they know that when they sin, they can go to God in confession and God's favorite thing of all to say to them is, I forgive you. Now that's historic biblical Christianity. So does mainline American Protestantism and their bogus doctrines lead to post-traumatic stress disorder like he says? It absolutely does. And and I myself would have left Christianity if the version of Christianity I clung to in my youth were actual Christianity. It would not be a religion worth clinging to. Mainline American Protestantism is not a religion worth clinging to, but historic, biblical Christianity, Christ-centered, cross-focused Christianity where Jesus is for you and for the forgiveness of your sins to guide you through the harshness of this world, that's Christianity worth clinging to. So let's let him go. Oh, we're going to skip. Now he's going to get into his arguments. We're going to skip ahead to 6 minutes and 35 seconds. And and um, 6, what did I say? 6.35. Yep. So we'll go to 6.34 just to be safe. And this, this is, so he's going to present his whole argument. We're skipping that part. That's part two. Now we're going to get into his hermeneutic, his principle of biblical interpretation, which again does not lend itself to, to, to anything positive to say about mainline American Christianity because he's not wrong. So let's go. Jesus lied. So what does mainstream Christianity have to say about this? Well, they generally give a few possibilities. Either Jesus didn't know when the end times would occur, or he was being metaphorical, or something along these lines. This is clearly a cop-out. It doesn't matter if Jesus knew or he didn't. He gave a time frame for when it would occur, and that doesn't negate a lie. Not to mention the fact that raises the question of Jesus being supposedly all-knowing. I don't have the time to go into why uh, in his earthly ministry Jesus knows some things and he doesn't. Um, but a simple explanation is that he is God in human flesh and he has the ability to do things that we don't. And there have been times throughout his earthly ministry where he has withheld information from himself. That is a sound theological response. Many theologians for millennia have thought this about Jesus. And, um, it, yeah, that's just what it is. So now we're going to get into the argument of literal or metaphorical. And this is where Protestants screw it up by and large. So let's just, let's let them go for a little bit. What about if it's metaphorical? So here's the thing. If the Bible is so unclear about what is metaphorical and what isn't, then how are you supposed to know what's true at all? How are you supposed to know which verses are a metaphor and which are literal? What about all the verses that are sexist and homophobic? Are those metaphorical or are they literal? What about every single sin, every single command, every single promise? How can you possibly decipher what's literal and what's not if such a blatant statement by Jesus can be contested? So in the Protestant mind, there are two types of verses in the Bible, metaphorical or symbolic and literal. And uh, oh, Protestants own it. Many of you, and I'm painting with a big broad brush here. If I were Bob Ross, I'd have the old two inch out. I know I'm painting with a broad brush. So don't come at me and say you're the exception. If you're the exception, I'm not talking about you. But by and large, Protestants will say, I take the Bible literally. 
you do. Until you get to things like this is my body and this is my blood. Until you get to things like baptism now saves you. Then, well, Jesus is being figurative. And I think he asks a legitimate question, Protestants. How do we know which verses are literal and which verses are metaphorical? Now, I'm not going to address sexism and homophobia in the Bible because I guarantee you he has taken every single one of those verses out of context. And the mistake that people like him often make is that they see something mentioned in the Bible and assume that that is the Bible condoning that thing, where in all actuality it is the Bible just reporting that that thing happened. So because it's mentioned in the Bible is not the Bible condoning it. So any argument that he could ever come up with about sexism and homophobia in the Bible is completely undone. The Bible is not sexist. The Bible is not homophobic. The Bible says the same thing about the sinful condition of straight people as it does gay people. The Bible says the same thing about the sinful condition of women as it does men. The Bible, when it preaches its law, is the great equalizer. So that, as the Bible says, every mouth may be stopped. But how do we know which ones are literal and which ones are figurative? And Protestants, you don't have a good answer for this. Here's the answer. The Bible is the word of God. And it is perfect. It is God-breathed. It is the word of God from the Holy Spirit to men who were carried along by the Holy Spirit, who even though they put in their own words and their own personality and their own ideas, were carried along by God the Holy Spirit to perfectly portray his word to us. Now, if we sit down and we have our Bible in front of us, we need to understand a few things. It is a piece of literature, and we need to understand that. And we need to understand that there are many types of literature. There is historical narrative. There is allegory. There is poetry. And in the Bible, there is apocalyptic literature. There are parables. So is the Bible literal all the time? No, it's not. Sometimes it's being poetic. Sometimes it is being figurative. And what mainline American Protestants refuse to understand is when it's being apocalyptic as a literary style. They neither understand nor care to understand why the book of Revelation was written the way it was. But if they just read the beginning of the book of Revelation, they would realize that it is very much filled with picture language so that the message can be hidden from those who at the time shouldn't hear it. This was this this was a letter to the churches and the churches needed to understand this and the churches being well versed in the Old Testament could understand the picture language of the book of Revelation. So is the book of Revelation literal? Yes, it is. But is it literal in the way Protestants think that these little bug creatures are going to crawl out of the ground or that there's going to be a literal thousand year reign of Christ? No, of course not. Absolutely not. Show me one reference in the Bible, the entire Bible, where a thousand years is mentioned literally. And then you get to a thousand years in Revelation, and all of a sudden that's literal? You people are stupid. You're just stupid. So how do we know what verses are what? We understand that the Bible is composed of multiple different linguistic types, and all of these types of ling linguistics, be it poetry, or history, or gospel, or law, or apocalyptic literature, all of these forms of literature are the very word of God, and they are true. So should Christians take the Bible literally? No, we should take it as is, as it presents itself to us. There is truth in the poetry, but it is still just poetry. There is truth in the apocalyptic literature, but we have to treat it like apocalyptic literature. And when Jesus is telling us a parable, we know he's telling us a parable. He'll often explain it. And when Jesus is being literal, this is my body, this is my blood. When Peter is being literal and says, baptism now saves you, you have to take those at face value too. So how do we know which verses are which? Easy. Scripture alone interprets scripture. We use the clear passages to interpret the unclear passages. And if he would take a little bit of time to do that, he would understand that what he says Jesus says in Matthew 16 and what he says Jesus says in Matthew 24, which we'll address in the next video, Jesus is not talking about the same event. So, of course, it doesn't make sense that he would say something that seemingly didn't happen because he's not talking about the same event. And if we would just read the Bible with 2020 vision, 20 verses before and 20 verses after, whatever it is we're looking at, we would get a really good idea 
of what's happening. So that's how we know what verses to take which way. We understand what type of literary style is being employed here, and we interpret unclear texts by looking at the clear texts. But let's let him go on for a little bit more. Remember that mainstream Christianity says that the Bible is the perfect yep. word of God, that it doesn't contain any errors whatsoever. Okay. Claiming that such an obvious statement by Jesus is somehow metaphorical is clearly a mm -hmm. cop-out. If you want to say that's metaphorical, then you might as well say the entire Bible is metaphorical. And guess what? If we say that the entire Bible is metaphorical and remove any verses that irrationally contain hatred, sexism, homophobia, etc., then I don't have a problem with it. Remove the irrational hatred and take the rest just as a story and metaphor, then fine. So if we strip the Bible completely of its actual intended meaning to show us our need for a savior and then to tell us that there is a savior, fine, 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 let it be that way. But he makes a valid point. It is a, it is a Protestant cop-out. Well, he was being figurative, he was being metaphorical. That's a cop-out. Protestants, get your shit together. Really. I mean... I was just talking to someone the other day about our Lutheran confessions. They're contained in a book that's this thick. What we believe, what we teach, what we confess. A book this thick. You want to know what mainline American Protestantism, by and large, has as their statements of faith? One, one page that you can scroll through in 10 minutes on their church's website. That's it. We need to be more serious about what we believe, and we need to look back at what Christians have said for 2,000 years about these things so that we can be confident that we are contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. The reason that I'm critical of mainstream religious ideas is because they're taken as literal, which leads to so many problems in the world. Mainstream Christianity takes the vast majority of the Bible as literal until a contradiction is encountered, of course. Convenient. Convenient, right? It is. He's not wrong. It's convenient. Mainline, again, painting with that big two-inch Bob Ross brush right now, but mainline American Protestants don't have any semblance of biblical discernment to stand up and, as Peter would instruct us, have an answer for the hope that they have. They don't have an answer. Well, I mean, clearly Jesus is being figurative. That's a cop-out. That is a cop-out. He's not wrong. And and th this is why I'm skipping his argument. I don't want to get wrapped around the axle on his way of interpreting these verses. I want to address why he does it this way. It's because of how he was brought up. And I'm sorry to say it, but mainline American Protestants, y'all owe this man a huge apology. Remember, mainstream Christianity says all the events of the end times, the rapture, the antichrist, the demons, etc., are literally going to happen. It's just the part about Jesus and his kingdom coming during the lifetimes of the people he's talking to that's metaphorical. Yeah. Yep. See, and that's the problem, which I've already addressed. They look at the book of Revelation like it's a book, of, like a checklist of things that have to happen in a certain order. And that's not how it's written at all. The Christian church has never interpreted the book of Revelation as it's interpreted today. That you, you, you keep reading all of these modern authors that are interpreting this um, premillennial, postmillennial, midmillennial, dispensationalist garbage, and yet you don't care to read the church fathers, what the earliest Christians thought and said and taught on these verses. I'm sorry, dispensationalism is not biblical. Amillennialism is. The millennium, this 1,000 year reign of Christ, is not literal. We are in the 1,000 year reign of Christ now. He is reigning. He has come into his kingdom. He has come into his glory now. And this is just a sneak peek of the answer to the problem. Was Jesus lying? No, he has come. His kingdom is now. This 1,000 year reign of Christ, when run through the lens of all the other references to 1,000 years in the Bible, means a period of time known only to God. That's what a thousand years means. And Christians, we need to be better at hermeneutics and exegesis so that we can stand up and have an answer when someone says something like this. This is a broken and hurting man. He may not admit it, 
He has found a false sense of joy and security in what he now believes, but Christianity, Protestantism, failed this man. Absolutely failed this man. Their piss-poor attempts to explain the Bible, their horrendous view of the end of the world, their eschatology, their doctrine of grace and original sin, all of it, the whole shebang, they have screwed up the whole of Christianity. They can't even get the gospel right. And they wonder why people turn out like him. You want to know, Protestants, why people end up like Morg? Go to your bathroom and look in the mirror. Hmm, look, this statement by Jesus is clearly wrong. It's a lie. Trying to claim otherwise is absurd. It's time to realize that these are just stories. That's it. But it's important to realize it because so much damage has been done by them. Countless people have died and it's led to the loss of women's rights as well as so many deplorable acts done to the LGBTQ community. We can see the harmful effects of religious ideas all around us right now as so many people's rights are in jeopardy. I personally suffered through the damage that mainstream religion causes when I left Christianity and experienced intense symptoms of religious trauma syndrome. Yes, you did. And I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm sincerely sorry that you were taught a false religion. Mainline American Christianity, Protestantism, Evangelicalism, whatever you want to call it, is a false religion. And I am so sorry. So sorry that you were taught that and that you suffer from religious trauma syndrome. I am deeply sorry. I'm deeply sorry. You might notice, now that I think about it, how the tone has changed. How I've gone from Protestants get your shit together to looking more literally in the eye on the screen in front of me and saying, I'm sorry. Because we need to discern when we are dealing with the false teachers and the falsely taught. I talked about this on New Year's Eve with Reverend War. How are we going to talk to the false teachers versus the falsely taught? Talking to you, Morg, man to man, Christian to, to non-Christian, I'm sorry. I apologize. You deserved better than a false religion. I'm sorry. Now, addressing his concerns about Christianity doing worlds of harm, that's just a load of bollocks. That is absolute bollocks. Sorry, I've been watching a lot of British television. Um, that's, that's a lie. Christians have done horrible things throughout the history of mankind. Lutherans have done horrible things throughout the history of mankind. The Peasants' War was a terrible thing. And Luther came out of hiding at risk to his own life to call them on their crap and to tell them to knock it off. So when Christians as individuals go astray, Christianity comes in and says, stop it. Christians have done irrevocable damage to the LGBT community. Christians have done irrevocable damage to women's rights. But Christianity as a whole lifts up and affirms all people. And looks at you and yes, it says you are a sinner. But then it follows it up with saying that's good news because Jesus only came for sinners. A proper distinction between law and gospel and the function of the law and the purpose of the gospel is, is actually what Christianity ought to be. That if you are an unrepentant sinner, you need to be broken by the law. But if you are a sinner who has been broken by God's law, then you need to hear that Jesus died for you. And just as you can look at individual examples of Christians being stupid throughout history, I could point to a wider swath on a global scale of Christianity being a bastion for good in the world. Medical science, hospitals, orphanages, all of these things, food pantries, all of these ministries that Christianity has done globally throughout two millennia, you cannot ignore those as well. So do individual Christians get it wrong? Yes. Does Christianity as a whole get it wrong? No. Christianity as a whole has been a mass force for good in this world. That is a fact. 
but let's let you make your final statement. It's time to build a better world where we can leave behind all the stories and all the hatred, suffering, and damage that they cause. Look at all the insanity going on in the world right now. All the division, the loss of women's rights, racism, death, and so much more. Look, Jesus isn't going to come back to save the world. That's a lie. The truth is, is that it's up to us. There's no savior coming. We are our own saviors and we can change everything right now. We can come together and build a new world. So come on, instead of waiting for a savior, let's save the world together. We have the power to make it happen. So what do you think? Do you think that this verse proves that Jesus is a liar? Tell me what you think in the comments and share this video everywhere. And check out my other videos if you want to know about my experience growing up with religion and help us wake up the world by subscribing right now. A big shout out to all my supporters all on right. Patreon. I'm going to address this in part two. Do I think this verse proves that Jesus lied? No. I think it proves that you were brought up in a false version of Christianity that has not taught you how to rightly discern the word of truth. That's what I think, but we're going to get to that in part two. So what do I think? What is my assessment of this? You were lied to. You were fed a false religion. Mainline American Protestantism is a false religion. I'm sorry, it is. You people don't know how to divide between law and gospel. You can't even preach the gospel right. I was asked recently to review a sermon by a pastor, and he, he turned I am the vine and you are the branches into the law. And I will say this. What do I think mainline American Protestants, addressing his statement, there's no savior coming, we are our own saviors. Uh, to put this in a Christian worldview, yes, Jesus is coming but you need to stop being so heavenly minded about it that you're no earthly good. Yes, Jesus is coming. Yes, that is our hope. And yes, we absolutely look to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We look forward to that. But what mainline American Protestantism by and large fails to understand while it's looking forward to Christ's coming, it fails to understand that he comes to us today, now. That he comes to us in his word, speaking forgiveness of sins. That he comes to us in his sacraments, washing us with the regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit in water and word. Feeding us with his very body and blood, given and shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. He feeds and sustains us now. He comes now. And we as Christians need to understand that he rules and reigns in his kingdom of grace over all things now. And we ultimately need to understand that Satan is bound now. He is like a dog chained to his doghouse. So that, yes, Peter can still say he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You've seen him do it in the zoos. They're behind the cage. They're seeking whom they may devour. They're looking at you like you're a piece of meat. But who gets in trouble? The idiots that crawl into the cage. That's Satan. He can bark. He can roar, he can prowl about looking for someone to devour, but he is defeated, he is chained, he has been told this far and no farther, and yes, there is a day coming where he will be unchained and unleashed upon this world, and God have mercy on all of us when he is. We need a better hermeneutic. We need to get better at exegeting the text and only drawing out of it what it says to us in context letting the clear passages interpret the unclear passages. And good God, Christians, Protestants, would you stop reading what the modern people are writing and start reading what the ancient church has said? It will clear up a lot of stuff for you. This has been a long video. I hope you stuck with me to the end. And I look forward to addressing his argument in part two so that we can know that no, Jesus did not lie about his second coming. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.